gives this the dagger. Oh! Illegal substitution, too many men on the field, Saskatchewan. Gizmo has a block and the sideline. He has not stepped out, he may go all the way. He needs one block and he'll do it easily. Promise mess I wouldn't do this. McDavid stops up, what a move, shoots, scores! Hey everybody, welcome to The Outsiders, powered by the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City. It is podcast 98 on Monday, March the 14th, season three for us. I'm Brent Griffiths. Robin Brownlee joins us. Robin, how you doing? Excellent, thanks. Well, we're a week away from the NHL trade deadline day, and we won't be on on the Monday. We'll be on on the Tuesday, kind of taking a look at everything that happened, but it's time to kind of look ahead with TSN's hockey insider, Darren Drager. Dregs, how you doing? I'm doing well, but I want the same deal. Is there any way you guys can accommodate me not being on on Monday? I, I'm happy to come back on on Tuesday for TSN, but Monday's kind of a big deal, so I is guess this, I can't. Is talk. this the craziest week for you, the week leading up to this, or are there other nutty weeks for you? Well, there are other nutty weeks. Uh, I think a free agency in the summer, um, you know, that that whole couple of week period in the summer is is chaotic and bizarre because you've got the draft and there's always activity around the draft. And like I said, free agency, this is probably the most challenging week, two weeks uh, of the season for any of us in the business, uh, business of being a hockey insider. And I, I, I used to joke now, I don't even bother because with social media, nobody seems to care as much as they once did. But I used to make my calls the day after trade deadline. Um, and I remember, and I think it was like a Yanni Nenema trade or something. Kevin Lowe was the general manager of the Oilers, and he was super sour. Uh, broke this trade. He tried yeah. to scuttle the deal because it got out again pre-social media. And I called him on my way home after uh, deadline, and I said, "Look, Kevin." I said, you know how this works. And he was still pretty hot. And I, I just said, look, it, I, I joke, but I'm kind of not kidding. It takes me 11 months to repair the damage that I do in the one month leading up to the trade deadline. <laughs> so I said, I, I guess we cross paths. I'll, I'll try and repair some of that damage. Well, Yanni had learned that trade watching TSN. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, Robin, you would have been probably in the beat on that one. He yep. saw it in the TV at the Saddle Dome before they even could get a hold of him. But that's just kind of the nature of the whole day. So sour. Hey. Oh. <laughs> and above all else, we know this, Darren, the number one thing on Kevin's mind was, how did you find out? Oh, who, yeah. Who told you? Who squealed? <laughs> he wanted that. After all, everything was said and done. He wanted that name so he could whatever when it was all done because you'd written the story or you'd broken the story yeah, on yeah. air like you do and but he wanted to know where you go well and and look i mean it's one of the benefits now of twitter and social media i mean it has negatively impacted all of our lives right uh, but from a pure professional perspective you know now the good beat people that cover their teams are on it and they're on it 365 days a year. So, you know, guys like me have to work a little bit of hard, harder to, to, to beat those guys. But what it's done is, you know, it's, it's just developed a scar tissue now among players, among coaches, among managers, all aspects of the hockey business, because they know that as soon as that, that agreement is made, regardless of the pending trade call, as we always tweet, you know, this deal is happening pending trade call. I mean, as soon as there's an agreement, it gets out. Got to ask you kind of the dynamics of how your week would work. What, what would you, how, where would you start? Would you just go through a through Z, even though there's no Z team in the national hockey league, but how, how would you do this? How, how would you, how would you lead up to it? Can you kind of give us a little yeah. insider on the insider? Yeah, well, for the moment, I mean, we're we're focused on maybe not the nibbling teams. Um, and I'd put the Oilers in that category. It's not that we're not interested in what Ken Holland and the Oilers might do, but frankly, they're bigger fish to fry. And so you're looking at the Montreal Canadiens, you're looking at the, at the Philadelphia Flyers with, 
you know, some of the bigger pieces and Claude Giroux and uh, obviously Ben Chirot and then some of the other candidates in, in Montreal. You're looking at Marc-Andre Fleury with the Chicago Blackhawks. So it's putting the pieces of the puzzle in place and separating fact from fiction. I mean, there are so many buyers that are involved in just those few players that I mentioned. So, you know, we do a nice job, and I'm going to pat ourselves on the back here. You can at do TSN. that. Yeah, of, of trying to divide and conquer. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, historically speaking, you know, if, if we just focus on trade deadline day, yeah, I mean, you know, Pierre Lebrun or Bob McKenzie, Darren Dreger might individually tweet a trade, but the truth is in certain situations, you know, the guy authoring the tweet may not have had a whole lot to do with actually breaking the information. Right. It's, you know, I mean, I'm on my phone or Pierre is on his phone, Bob is on his phone, whomever. And yes, we're like okay, sharing, you know, I, now and look, we're trying to do a TV show. James Duthie is like a trained seal as the main <laughs> host there. Yeah. And, he, and and every once in a while, he does need a break. And then the trade breakers are there to do exactly that. So he wants to get to us for the information as quickly as possible. So we kind of have a uh, you know, unwritten rule, you know, if it's your trade, you're, you're probably going to want to present it on TV because TV matters most. Right. Yeah. I mean, of course you guys know that. Um, and then you've got Pierre, Bob, myself as, as the other option to, uh, to, to, to tweet it out. So that's kind of how we go about it. So there's always twists and turns leading up to the, like right now is we're having this conversation. I mean, LeBron, myself, Chris Johnson, Bob McKenzie are on a, a, a group chat. Yeah. And I mean, in the last five minutes, there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Eight submissions. In five from, minutes. In five minutes. And guess what? This won't uh, shock you even a little bit because the man loves to talk and he likes to hear his voice. LeBron is like seven of those eight. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, the, two of the names I hear more than anybody, and it's just because of their their profile, I think. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the Mark Mark Andre Fleury and, and, yeah. and Claude Giroux. Is there any way Fleury's going to move? I mean, it was sketchy if he was even going to play this year. Now he's right. gone to a team. Uh, is is he willing to move? Is there a circumstance out there for him? Well, they're talking about it, Robin. Um, he, he's going to have to make that determination and sooner rather than later. And then beyond that, so let's assume that he does want to chase his fourth Stanley Cup. You know, what is the market for Marc-Andre Fleury? You know, I mean, I'm watching Colorado and all of a sudden Darcy Kemper looks like He's playing pretty good hockey right yeah. now. So, you know, do they feel that need in Colorado? And, and you know, we in the media have wanted to connect Flurry and, and Colorado for months now. Mm -hmm. You know, Toronto has a glaring need all of a sudden. Edmonton has had that need for a long, long time. Yeah. But, you know, is Flurry going to wave? Is he, is, is he going to embrace opportunity in Edmonton or even Toronto? Probably not. I'm not so sure about yeah. that. Probably not. Probably not. And I get it. You know, look, I, I, you know, when you talk about players who are in that position and, you know, Claude Giroux is, is interesting, right? He's about to play his 1000th game with the Philadelphia Flyers. So beyond that, he's entrenched in, in Philadelphia, but in Fleury's case, again, he's won three Stanley cups. He's got a hall of fame career, you know, why would you go to Toronto with the uncertainty throughout the Leafs? Uh, I mean, their, their defensive game is not good enough right now. Um, and be attacked, be scrutinized every second of your existence in Toronto. If I'm him, I'm like, yeah, thanks, but no, no thanks. Yeah. No, thanks. So it's it, flurry to me is the most interesting of the goaltender market. And that market, which we viewed as thin, all of a sudden now is a commodity, right? And yeah. so the price for Marc-Andre Fleury is off the charts. You know, the price for Braden Holtby, Marty Jones, go down the list of, of all of these guys, is all of a sudden gone up because nobody wants to do the Toronto Maple Leafs or any of these teams, for that matter, in the market for a goalie a favor. Got to tell you, through the time that I spent working inside for the Edmonton Oilers, 
one of the things that I learned the week before trade deadline is that the phones can be crazy and then it can just die yeah. on the Monday. Or it can be, I still remember there were Glenn Sather saying once he had hardly had any calls and then all of a sudden yeah. the night before things really started to pick up. So it's really hard to say which team is going to be hyperactive the week yeah. before, is it not? It really, really is. And the prices are always high. I mean, even for selling teams, I mean, you're not selling assets for next to nothing. I mean, maybe you do that when you get to the 11th hour on Monday and you realize that you're not going to get what you expected. So you, know, you want to blow out a pending unrestricted free agent. Um, I would say this though, Bren, um, you know, based on, on the communication, believe it or not, my phone started buzzing at 11 o'clock Eastern Sunday night, 11 o'clock Eastern. Yeah. I'm watching curling. Now, I'm watching the extra end. Yes, you are. And Gushu and, uh, and, and Kevin Cooey. And I'm like, Who's calling me a lot anyway? Um, and then following up on it uh, this morning as we record on Monday, um, yeah, there's 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 a lot more tangible conversation, meaning that you're getting to that place where it's all right. We're either doing this or we're not, and and but we're talking about those players. We're talking about Ben Sherrod. Um, the waiting game is going to apply to Giroux and the Flurry because they fully control, you know, their, their process, but it's, it's definitely from a, from an interest in a call perspective, heated up, whether or not that translates into something this week, I, I suspect Ben Sherrod is going to be traded in the next 48 to 72 hours. Okay. That's, that's based on the interest that, that seems to have developed over the last few days. Darren, three younger players who, who, who don't have the, uh, Giroux or Flurry profile, but I think are of, of mass interest out there if something can be done. Uh, Jake DeBrusque, Brock Besser, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Jacob Chikrin. A lot of mm -hmm. the Oiler fans out here say Chikrin, Chikrin, Chikrin. Give, give <laughs> them whatever they would want to get him. I'm not so sure. I don't know what he did to himself against Boston yeah. Yeah. on the weekend. He went into the boards awful awkward there. Those three younger players, though, uh, who do you think gets the most play uh, uh, in your mind? Mm, well... I'm not convinced that, okay, you know, health aside, if Jacob Chickering is healthy enough to be part of, you know, the dialogue between now and, and Monday, I, I don't see why Bill Armstrong would back off what he's asked for. And what he's asked for is just a gross overpayment. But, yeah. you know, the kid is 23 years of age. He's got cost certainty at 4.6 million for three yeah. years after this season. Yeah. So, you know, if he's a, a second pairing guy on a good team, all right. I, I mean, you still have locked in cost certainty. I just don't understand. Look, if Bill Armstrong isn't going to get that at trade deadline, why wouldn't he wait and see what the environment is at the draft or in the off season? So I'm not convinced there. Um, you know, Brock Besser is intriguing to me. He's got the big qualifying offer. You know, the restricted free agents are always uh, a challenge. I feel like Besser should be higher up the trade list than most of us have him. Um, and, you know, I think that that's based on a level of interest, but I also think from Vancouver's standpoint, that's based on some of the off season finagling they're going to have to do with their salary cap. And, and Jake DeBrusque is curious to me. I, I like him as a player. Um, I like him a lot more based on how he's played over the last few weeks mm -hmm. because he's played his way up into the lineup, back into the good books of, of Cassidy in, in Boston. But man, that name's been out there forever. Yeah. Like Jake DeBrusque has been in trade speculation, not just this year, but last year, maybe even the year before. I Hey, before Butch Navich ended up going from the Rangers to the St. Louis Blues, yeah. I remember following the trail of the St. Louis Blues and Jake DeBrusque and the Boston Bruins. And they just, they, they couldn't make it work because, you know, probably Boston wanted Robbie Thomas or Jordan Cairo or somebody like that in, in return. So three very young, interesting pieces, Robin, but it feels to me that it's more likely between DeBrusque and Besser 
as to who goes first, because I don't, I just don't know why Arizona would feel the urgency to move Checker unless they get exactly what they want. I'll stretch this question out a little longer so you can have a blast of your coffee and Bailey's and also quickly check your text <laughs> messages. Okay. Good, just because did your, I'm sure your phone was the one that vibrated. I, it would have she to did, be yours, yes, not ours. Yes, yes, um, a yeah. couple of things. Let's take a look at, at the, uh, the goaltending situation is normally we're always looking for the big winger or the big uh, yeah. forward to go. It just seems that there are a lot of teams right now that are bubble teams. They just got to find that goaltender, and that could really change a lot of seasons for a lot of teams that are bubble teams. Are you feeling the same way? Yeah, I am. And and that's why when I mentioned earlier that the goalie market has been bolstered, it's not because of the quality of the goaltenders who are available. It's because all of a sudden there's a higher level of, of urgency. Yeah. And that can happen. Hey, look, it's, you know, injury plays a big part of it, but so does crappy defense and, and goaltending when you need it to be stable and, and trending upwards as you get deep into the second half of the season. And that's where Toronto finds themselves. Frankly, they're in a quagmire. I mean, Toronto yeah. needs uh, a defenseman. You know, you could say the same thing about the Oilers. I mean, the Oilers are looking for that right side D. We've been talking about that for a long time. A long time. Yeah. Um, they just don't have the assets, nor do they want to part with the assets to get a piece that is actually going to help them there. And you could say the same thing in goaltending in Edmonton. Toronto, though, I feel like there's a higher level of urgency, not necessarily want. I mean, you know, the Oilers want to do well in the playoffs as much as any team that's on the cusp of making the playoffs. Um, But I think that there's more of a feeling of desperation in Toronto. You know, this team is stacked up against, well, Tampa Bay, Florida, pick your poison going into round one of the playoffs. And if, if they bow out gracefully or otherwise in round one, there's probably going to be significant change to the hockey operations department of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So if you're Kyle Dewis, you know, you know that you've been talking openly about trying to improve your defense, but now all of a sudden, You've got Jack Campbell on the sidelines. He's hurt. Peter Morazic, man. I don't know. I don't, he's having the worst career of his or worst season of his career. Um, and and part of his bad luck and shoddy defense, like it was in the outdoor game uh, in Hamilton yesterday. But now all of a sudden, the assets that they were hoping to be able to use to get Anybody. You know, a defenseman that's going to help. Yeah, you know now they've got to look at well, geez, well, you know, you know maybe we do have to throw Nick Robertson into the equation, but who are we talking about here? Pierre Dorian has come out and said that he's not trading Anton Forsberg. Yeah, right. Oh, is that, is that the hotline? You. Do you, you know? need to get that? We can stop. No, I don't need to get that. Okay, are you, you sure? Know, like, how many people actually have a landline anymore? Uh, like, Darren well, Drager. I do. Yeah, apparently I do. My apologies. Um, anyway, Why don't you just pick it up, up and find out who it is for us? Do you want to do no, that? No, because it's never anybody good. It's somebody who wants to clean my ducks. <laughs> it's somebody from Revenue Canada who's fictitiously trying to scam me. Okay, it's, all right. It's something along those okay. lines. Okay, we need your, um, need your pin. Yeah, yeah. So, just a, like I, I think, I think that Dorian is trolling a little bit. Yeah, Anton Forsberg, guys, for me, um, he'd be the least risky of anybody out there. For for. Maybe an affordable cost, but you know they've got they've got Matt Murray who's out probably longer than than what the the club has acknowledged. So, you know, you've got Vegas who who knows what Kelly McCrimmon is going to have to do there with Robin Leonard on the fence. New Jersey has said they need a goaltender. Uh, on and on and on it goes. So. I, I think that people are going to overpay and not necessarily upgrade in that position by doing that. I got to ask you something, and I don't know if you know. Um, I know that I do not. Uh, well, no, because it's a subtle thing. Uh, Evander Kane. Yeah. Uh, he has been everything you could have hoped for uh, on the ice yeah. so far with the Oilers. Now, um, if you're Ken Hall, and I wonder what you do with this guy if it stays the same between now and the end of the year, uh, Kane has said, <clears throat> I get uh, painted in a tough way sometimes. We know the issues that have been put out there. Uh, yeah. Being accused of something doesn't necessarily mean you did it. On and on and on. I was against the idea of bringing him in because I thought even if it's a subtle thing where he's just kind of toxic in the dressing room, even if there's no legal problems, I just thought, no, I'd rather avoid all that. Well, I'm not in the room. I don't yeah. know what happens. 
when you look at a situation like Kane, if the Oilers can re-sign him at a decent price, that's like... That's going to be the key, Robin. Decent yeah. price. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's like the trade deadline acquisition already, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, 100% agree with you. Um, there obviously has to be a, a, a discussion with Dan Milstein, who represents Evander Kane. Um, you know, first of all, does Evander Kane want to extend in Edmonton? I, I right. see no reason why he wouldn't. You know, I doubt that there's going to be any sort of uh, catastrophic change with the roster. And by that, I mean Drysaddle or McDavid, despite what some in the East like to speculate to ruffle the feathers of those in Edmonton. It works. Uh, it is, sure it does, but it's no different than those in Western Canada chirping about Austin Matthews in Toronto. Oh, yeah. And that's part of the fun, right? Um, uh, look, if, if I were Kenny Holland, based on what I've seen in watching Evander Kane, I would want to engage in a conversation. But if I'm extending Evander Kane, that term is going to be super short. He's probably going to have to go another year, maybe two, maybe two if if the money is affordable. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a slight on Evander Kane. That's not looking at his history and saying that he doesn't deserve more. No, he's a pending unrestricted free agent. If Evander Kane knows and believes that he can get more from another market, fill your boots. Go to free agency. You've earned it. That's what unrestricted free agency is all about. I just, if I'm in Edmonton, given, you know, they're going to constantly wrestle with the salary cap, they have more pressing needs. So if the money in the term doesn't make sense with Kane, you push away. Yeah. Yeah. And you've touched on exactly what I'm thinking, Darren. Um, I don't think there's a question about the player's ability on the ice. Yeah. But at 30, uh, if he doesn't get a four-year or five-year deal now, he's not going to get one. Uh, right. at, because if you go two years, now you're 32. Uh, who's going to offer four years at that point? You start to no. see a diminishing return. Um, two years. Uh, would you go Would you go three if that meant cat no. keeping in the fewer cat? No. Hall, you wouldn't go no. That I wouldn't. No. I, I mean, again, yeah, I guess what's the cap hit here? Um, you know, yeah. based on the money that the Oilers paid to sign Evander Kane for the remainder of this season. He's a rental. And and frankly, they, they paid more than the rest of the market was willing to yeah. pay. Yeah. Now, that's not why Evander Kane chose Edmonton entirely, but it helped. It, sure. It certainly sweetened the, uh, the, uh, the option. So yeah. three years would be a stretch for me, man. Um, because here's the issue. The issue is, and it's unfair to Evander Kane, but it's it's the reality of his situation and time in the NHL. Yep. If things don't go well in year one of that extension or the start of year two, you're stuck. Yeah. You're not moving that deal. Yeah. You're not moving it. Because people wrongly would look at him and go, well, he's past the point of being a reclamation project. Right. He's just past that point. They might take him in the second half of the third year of the deal. If, you know, he's still healthy and strong. I I think we all can appreciate his game. We oh, like his oh, yeah. game. He, he provides something that every team in the national hockey league definitely wants. Three is too long for me. Let me throw another free agent or an unrestricted free agent uh, situation at you. I'm kind of enjoying watching uh, Johnny Goodrow the way he's been playing. But you know it's <laughs> yeah, a contract but... year. And uh, so you go, am I shocked? No, not yeah. really. But no. if you're in Calgary, you got to be loving it because this is might be your all-in season. Yeah. But you got to also recognize that you got some work to be done if you're Brad Trail Living yeah. coming this, uh, this offseason. But uh, what are you hearing on that front? Well, the fact that the Calgary Flames have played so well and have played their way into the conversation of being a top contender, yep. legitimately they are, uh, until proven otherwise, that bodes well for Johnny Goudreau extending in Cal- Calgary. For their own reasons, mostly the player and not the club, they decided that they weren't neg- going to negotiate in season. Um, and that's got to be a, a difficult process for, for Brad Trilliving in the Calgary Flames because really the player is saying, I don't want it to be a distraction, but – 
I want to see. I'd like to see what the market yeah. looks like. Yeah. And I'd do the same thing. Why sure. wouldn't you, right? You know, Philip Forsberg and Nashville, those are the two players that I'm most intrigued by looking towards the summer. Phil Forsberg and and Johnny Goudreau. Um, and look, I mean, if 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 Forsberg goes to open market, I think his camp believes that he could press close to 10 million a year. He, in the nines, right? Well, is he going to get that from Nashville? Nah, I mean, Roman Yossi is their human salary cap. He's yep. he's, at, he's at around nine. So where does Goudreau come in? I would put Forsberg a, just a stitch higher than Goudreau, right or wrong. That's just how I feel. Yeah, just a little. Um, just a little. So can Calgary take that on? Uh, I just, I mean, I mean, there are teams, and we know they are. They're New Jersey, Philadelphia. I mean, go down the list. They're just sitting there looking at Goudreau and what he's doing now and just going, okay. Plus, he also brought up two teams where he's from that area, right yeah, between those yeah, two places. Yeah, for sure. It's for a little sure. bit tempting, I guess. But if, if Calgary actually continues to play as well as they have, you know, they – God, make it to the Western Conference final. I mean, pie in the sky stuff here. Um, it's tough for players. I mean, players are incredibly loyal, right? They, yeah. And then when you get a taste of winning and you're part of a group that has proven that they can win, well, that that's going to help the Calgary Flames in their quest to re-sign them. Hey, Jack Eichel, Vegas. Um, yeah. What do you think about that so far? I just saw a clip of him commenting on how loud they were in Buffalo finally, now that he's out of there. Um, Sounded like a little bit of sour grapes to me. I don't know, a little (laughs) little chip on the shoulder. But what about uh, Eichel in Vegas? He's back earlier than most people thought he might be. Right. Um, What's down the road for him there, do you think? Yeah, I mean, time will tell. And I know that that's, you know, just kind of deflecting. I, I still, as as a fan of Jack Eichel, as a hockey player, when he was healthy, I mean, he was a star, maybe bordering superstar player in the NHL. Uh, I hope he can get there from a fan perspective. I like a bit of snarl in the personality of players, and, and he has that. I had no problem with his jab on Buffalo. I mean, you know, he left during a messy time and he orchestrated his departure from the Buffalo Sabres. I'm sure he expected the, 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 the fans to react the way they did. They paid good money. They should have reacted and booed him mercilessly. I get that. That's all well and good. Vegas needs him to be the player that he once was. And I don't know that he can ever get there. That's why I said time will tell. But what I know is this guys, um, you know, we're all looking at the Vegas golden Knights and we're going, Man, it just feels like it's a ticking time bomb there. Yeah. And and I feel like maybe we're just not being fair here. I looked this week and they've got eight regular players out of their lineup because of injury. Eight regular players. And we're we're talking about key personnel here, goaltending, defense, up front. Uh, so as they start to get healthy again here, and, and that's going to happen sooner than later, you know, if McCrimmon doesn't do anything or does very little, so Jack Eichel is his big, big trade acquisition this year, and every player that comes in off of the injury list is going to feel like an add-on. So they're just begging to stay in the playoff mix until they get healthy again. They feel like if they can lock down a playoff spot in the West, they've got a legit chance of winning the Stanley Cup based on roster and based on good health. If they're there, they honestly believe they're a top Stanley Cup contender. I, I This is completely out there. I just want to throw it out there. Uh, cringeworthy. These tribute videos. Uh, okay, I know that he was in Buffalo, but they did this tribute video, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. Like, how many times now are we saying that when a guy goes back, he maybe had one season <laughs> And there's tribute videos. It has it gone too far? Uh, for the most part, it has. I know I mean, it's for the fans, you know, but hey. It is. But how many fans are actually watching, right? Like, I mean, who are committed to what they're seeing. You know, maybe a ha- handful of times across the course of the year with all 32 teams, maybe. Yeah. But it is it is borderline ridiculous. I, I'm waiting for the team. Like, we see all kinds of paper transactions, right, where, you know, be it, you know, American League transactions or in certain cases, and I think Toronto and Robin Leonard joked about it recently where he was used, the Maple Leafs were used as that third party when Leonard was was ultimately shipped to uh, to Vegas. 
you know, Toronto should have tongue in cheek <laughs> rolled out a 45 second Robin <laughs> Leonard tribute. See, that would be funny. That would make it worthwhile for the most part. It's, it's a little cringy. You're right. Well, so you, well, you, you, you have the Hyman one in Toronto where there's nobody yeah. even in the stands uh, and he's kind of waving at the crowd. I thought that was quite entertaining. <laughs> I, I found that funnier than some of these other ones, but the Buffalo one, I just went, oh, my God. I that know. just did not end very well, boys. No, it didn't. It didn't. The tribute videos for me are like the, uh, and I know some people disagree because there's <laughs> revenue there, are like the outdoor games and we just had one. I want to get yeah. to that, Robin. And, uh, enough already. Uh, I, uh, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe, I, uh, maybe I'm in the minority here because there's talk we may get another one back here in Edmonton after the, the Heritage Classic was so big, but to me that barely made a ripple. Um, is there such a is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? Oh God, yeah. And and for me, they crossed that line years ago. Yeah, <laughs> years ago. The whole stadium series concept to me. But again, it's not. It's like All Star Weekend. It's not about us. It's right. it's about the fans. It's about generating revenue, giving yeah. back to the sponsors, all that. But here's the thing. And you left so, one out, Darren. It's for that market, that specific 100%. market, right? Yeah, and, and the one in Hamilton yesterday, I guess the takeaway for me was at least when you went to the big house in Michigan or used the NFL facilities where you've got these massive, massive football parks, you know, with 50, 75, 100,000 people, it is an enormous spectacle. And you see the overhead shot, and you're looking at all these people, and you're like, you can't see the puck. You have no idea who the players are. You're just there because you, you want to be part of it. And I yeah. get that. So they use the overhead of uh, in Hamilton. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. Because like, it just looks like what it is. It's a, it's a nice, comfortable, kind of romantic, small Canadian venue. That's what it is. But it just looked a little desperate to me. Got to talk. Now, by the time somebody downloads this podcast, it could be well over. But the Austin Matthews cross-check on Rasmus Dalin. Egregious. Awful. Just horrible. Oh, yeah. uh, and it, now, I know he's got really no track record here, but Conor McDavid got a a one or a two game suspension for something similar, but yeah. uh, he, certainly these, they've got to send a message. Cause he didn't, he, he said that he was trying to shoot yeah. for his shoulder. He never came even close to yeah. his shoulder. Sure. He no. did. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I kind of, I didn't get my knuckles wrapped, but I was on radio in Toronto and I, I suggested that if you go back to 2017, there was a play with uh, Gabe Landis Gog of the avalanche and Matthew Kachuk behind, I think it was, doesn't matter. It was behind the net, uh, but they're battling for the puck. They're legitimately battling for the puck. Um, Landis Gog cross checks Kachuk side of the ribs. He goes down, and on his way down, Landis Gog tags him almost identical side yeah. of the face. Right, but at least it was in the spirit of compete in the battle for the puck. And Landis Gog ended up getting four games for that. Now you remember Kara? Who did he cross check? Um, that was a cross check to the head that earned him a yeah. two game suspension. I feel now. So I said that I, I use Landis Gog as my, uh, as my exhibit a on radio in Toronto. And I guess the department of player safety was watching or listening because I was corrected and said, well, it was his second offense, which is fair. So Kara got two games. And I think there was another one. Up, uh, so the, the messaging to me is that as, as, as retaliatory as this one was, and it was. Yep. Matthews was sour, frustrated with how the game was going. He was getting the business from Rasmus Dahlin in, in, in front of the Buffalo, and, and he, he just snapped. Okay, that happens. That happens, But you yep. got to pay the price for it. So, I, I mean, it won't be three or four. It'll be a one or two game suspension, but uh, he'll be suspended. If I would ask you right now, who are your top two teams in the West and the East? You know, this would have been an easier one to answer about two or three months ago, for me personally. Right yeah. now, though, I'm really struggling with the top two teams in the West and the top two teams in the East. Do you uh, yeah, do you want yeah. to take that one on? Uh, I mean, I'll try my best here. Um, Let's start with the right West. Now, Let's start with yeah, the West. I, I, I mean, right now, I've got Calgary and I've got Colorado. Okay. Um, 
Those are my for a lot of different reasons. And, but I'm hedging because as you know, I'm not going to go down the Vegas path again. We we talked about that. I think if Vegas gets healthy, then I might flip one of the top two because I do think Vegas is built to be a Stanley cup winner Uh, in the East. It's, it's the Florida teams. It's the Florida teams for me. And I, you know, Tampa Bay, just given their experience, the ridiculous amount of hockey that that club has played in the last few years, they just know how to beat you every single way. You know, we look at wrongly in the East, we look at the teams in the West and we talk about this heavy Western game. St. Louis plays a heavy game. Winnipeg, who knows, they're probably not going to make it, but when they were at their best, they played a heavy game. It's that Calgary Flames are a heavy physical team to play against. Watch a Tampa Bay game. Watch them play. Daryl Sutter commented on the Tampa Bay Lightning, I think it was last week, talking about how big they are in the primary areas of need. And yep. that is on the back end and up the middle. You know, look at what they've got at center ice in Tampa Bay. So I have no reason to look beyond Tampa Bay Lightning. And I think Billy Zito is going to be a player here, fellas, this week. This week, I think, well, leading up to the deadline. You know, we talked about Ben Chirot. I think Florida is real interested in Ben Chirot. Maybe... Giroux, they can't probably can't manufacture both, but he's going to add some interesting pieces that are going to make the Florida Panthers. If not, if they're not formidable now, they're definitely going to be even more so after the deadline or before. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned Zito. God, I remember thinking the first time I saw Bill Zito, he was walking into the room. I thought he looked like a used car salesman. Um, <laughs> He was rep- like a Herb rep- Tarlick yeah. kind of sense. He was representing yeah. Brad Norton, I want to say, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the Oilers. But anyway, th- that's an aside. I mean, he's clearly not a used car salesman. But <laughs> And there's um, nothing wrong with that. No. no I know no, used not. car salesmen. They're fine, but Robin. They're good people. Yeah. Bring, bring you back to Alberta because <laughs> on, 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 on the two teams here, Darren, um, I was writing last year about what a difference – Daryl Sutter was going to make. Uh, yeah. I know Jeff Ward. I respect Jeff Ward. I like Jeff Ward, but that the Jolly Rancher was going to come in and change things, and uh, uh, they were going to play tough Sutter hockey, and they were going to be a force to yeah. be reckoned with down the stretch. Well, they weren't. Uh, now, this season they are. Here in Edmonton, I wonder – do the Oilers have a chance to contend? And by contend, I mean go beyond making the playoffs, but maybe win a round with the goaltending they've got now, whether it's Koskinen and Smith, Koskinen and Skinner, two out of any of the three. If they can get 915 mm-hmm. goaltending from those guys, which they have at times, are yeah. they good enough to make some noise in the playoffs? Because they aren't at 900 or 850, 895. We know that. Yeah. But at 915, which is not off the charts, are they good enough to win a round? Mm, not without, uh, I think, significant underachievement by whomever they're going to face in, in the first round. Um and not just on goaltending, Robin. I, you know, again, you guys pay close attention to the makeup of that roster. Um, their defense just flat out isn't good enough. I mean, on the right side, you've got Barry and Bouchard. Evan Bouchard, to me, looks like he, if he hasn't taken a step back, he's he's plateaued in his development. That's not to say that that he is a bust or there isn't a lot more to come. Because we've seen that so many times, right? And you never give up on good young defensemen. Uh, I just, he's he's flatline for whatever reason. That side needs attention to me. Um, Similar in Toronto, you cannot always outscore your mistakes, right? And so Edmonton has gone through a tough stretch of of where their special teams um, have been subpar. Mm -hmm. So... Again, is it is it possible they find lightning in a bottle? Of course it is. Uh, you know, we do have to respect the amount of talent they have. And if one of those two goaltenders can just give them adequate goaltending, slightly above average goaltending, then it is possible. But I think that that would have to be because of disappointment uh, on the team that they're playing against. I've been bitching, whining, and complaining about this now for uh, at least five or six years. And that is, it's their bottom six forwards that are a killer for me. When they yeah. get a good effort out of their bottom six, 
takes a lot of pressure off of the top two lines. They're a lot tougher team against <laughs> the sure. Winnipeg Jets. The bottom two lines did nothing. Yeah. You just needed to check the top two guys I- enough. And yeah. then the goaltending was just slightly better. I-, I actually thought Mike Smith was not bad against the Winnipeg mm-hmm. Jets. But the guy at the other end was just a little bit better. For me, this is boiling down to their bottom six players. They've just got to be better. They've got to take some pressure off of the top guys. And if they can get that, I think they can surprise. But it's uh, there's a, so yeah. many the, – the jury's out on so many things, Darren. Yeah, no question. And But you, know, you bring up a very good point. Historically, you look at the Stanley Cup champions, they've always got depth in scoring. Yeah. You know, Tampa Bay, uh, their bottom six, they're impactful. Like, they're at times almost interchangeable, right? Like, you know, whether you're rolling out your third or your fourth line, they can be as impactful as your top six. And that's saying a lot when you look at how decorated the top six of the Tampa Bay Lightning are. But historically, when you don't have that wave after wave push from your middle six to your bottom six, it just it makes a defensive side of the game not easy, but easier to manage so that's it that's always seemed like it was point. gourd yeah. or it was Kalorn or somebody a little yeah. bit different than those big guys right absolutely yeah absolutely hey uh we got robin another hockey question before we wrap this baby up well no it's not a hockey question okay so much, but because i know darren's got to go but yeah. before we do let him go uh, i'm just wondering what do you make of uh, the podcast by Ryan Rashog. <laughs> uh, you know what? He's a, he's been a good friend to us. He's come on yeah. our podcast. I know you and Ray I have a podcast that's widely uh, downloaded. Uh, Shogger's throwing his hat into the ring. Uh, uh, what do you think about that and the format he's got going? Well, truthfully, I've had a lot of time to think about it because he's called me about 4,800 times yeah. since uh, Ditto. he originally conceived this idea. Uh, but that's just anybody who knows Ryan knows that, you know, he is obsessive when it comes to projects and he throws everything that he has into it and, and behind it. Um, look, I mean, initially when he said, look, I'm thinking of doing a podcast. I mean, we probably all rolled our eyes. I mean, we we're, we're all in that vein and there's a bazillion hockey related sport related podcasts. You're like, all right, well, I guess, I mean, everybody else is doing one. Why wouldn't you? And then he said, okay, but mine is going to be different. And here's why. And he pitched the concept of got your back. And honestly, guys, I, that's kind of all you need in certain situations is a hook. And what caught my attention about it, I'm better than I used to be, but I'm still not great at blocking out social media, you know? Um, And I spend some time, not a lot of time on replies and the cheap shots and the garbage, the negativity that's thrown my way and thrown the way of others. And from time to time, it weighs you down. So the fact that Ryan has drilled down on something that is going to inject some positivity into our world Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm all for it, man. I'm all for it. I just—he's going to drive us all bonkers, though, right? I mean, from the guests that he has on to how meticulous he is with details. We had a conference call with James Duthie, myself, and and Rashad the other day, just shooting some the the breeze. And undoubtedly, you know, we're probably going to be involved in some way, shape, or form, uh, form part time, whatever. And about five minutes into this conversation, I'm like, I'm out. No, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what? It's going to be successful, no question. Well, I, I, hey, best of luck to uh, Ryan with it. I, I know it's going to be great. He's going to have a lot of fun with it. But it's, it's, you're right about having a little bit of a hook because we had him on last week, and he yeah. referred to our podcast as about as comfortable a pair of shoes as you can put on. We're a <laughs> coffee and Bailey's group. We love to have just a casual conversation, and that's been what we've gone with. Let's quickly yeah. talk about your podcast with uh, with the big guy. Do you see Ray very much anymore other than like this on Zoom? Because he's all over the place. No, I don't, and, and it, it definitely feels like I see him a lot because you're right. I mean, I see him weekly, obviously, with the podcast. I am going to see him this week. You know, he's coming into Toronto for March 21st, um, so we'll spend some some time there. I was in Vancouver in the fall, so I got to spend some time there with Ray and, and Cammy and the boys, and uh, we, uh, we had a good time of socializing and uh getting back on track but uh he's a busy guy man and 
now that much more busy with Cammy taking on the role as assistant general yeah. manager of the Vancouver Canucks. So now Ray is, uh, he's trying to run a good chunk of the household on top of doing everything else that he does. And finally, non-sports, or well, not non-sports, non-hockey related, any yeah. big sports. So you mentioned you watched the Briar men's final. Uh, that, yeah. that was exciting. Anything else? Uh, Tom Brady is back. What a oh shock. My goodness. Oh my goodness. I hope this isn't going to turn into Sugar Ray Leonard. No, uh, but you know what? I am, I'm a, I'm an NFL fan. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, I, I gamble on games. I, you know, I don't, but I don't have a team per se. So this is going to sound like the, the biggest bandwagon rider of all time. As soon as Tom Brady signed in Tampa Bay, I became a Tampa Bay fan. I'm a Tom Brady fan. So um, it feels like a pretty big troll drop by, by Brady. Yeah. To pull, especially the guy who paid what five hundred and some thousand dollars for his last ball. Uh, but you know, I, I mean, it, I, I couldn't believe that he was retiring in the first place, just yeah. given how, how dominant he was at the end of the season. So, yeah, that one was uh, that was heavy news late last night. So golf, curling, and Tom Brady that consumed my Sunday. Nothing well, about my team, the Denver Broncos, picking up a quarterback this past week, which I was Russell so wrapped Wilson, up in yeah, what I was doing. Yeah. I didn't know it happened for two days, but that's an interesting yeah. move, too. I don't know what's going on in Seattle either. Well, I got a big, uh, well, buddy of mine's a huge Seahawks fan, right? Yeah. So, and he's a businessman, so he doesn't have the same amount of time that I have to, to zip through social media. So I knew that the deal was going down as I'm watching it unfold by Rappaport or whoever had reported it initially. And I text my buddy, Alex, and I'm like, uh, I said, eh, now what are you going to do? Are you in the fetal position as a Seahawks fan? And he didn't know. And he responded about 15 minutes later. But so typical of a rabid sports fan. Well, if he doesn't want to be here, we don't want him. Right. We don't want anybody who doesn't want to be part of the – get good riddance. Like, like come, <laughs> come on. on. Yeah, seriously. So, and you yeah. know what he did the moment he hung up with you? It was like, oh, my God. Yeah, we're in oh, trouble. We're in big trouble. Hey, uh, yeah. before we go, do a, let's do a little LeBron check. Uh, how many uh, text messages have you had since we uh, we started oh, this oh, 40 oh, minutes yeah. ago? Uh, LeBron, okay. Has so it calmed down a little bit? Um, Is he just chilling? What? Uh, well, he – so that flurry of, of uh, texts that he sent at the beginning of this yeah. conversation, yeah. Uh, Chris Johnson weighed in, and he submitted – a bit of information and LeBron goes, Oh, interesting. You should tweet that. And then Chris Johnson, who's got a real dry sense of wit says, no, I'm too busy tweeting the essay that you dumped into this. (laughs) (laughs) So that was part of the seven of eight chain. So now you can add one, two, three, four more. Okay. Well, that's all right. That's still pretty damn good. Uh, Good luck. When is, when do you guys start your trade deadline show on the Monday? Early? Oh, boy. Yeah, like 8 a.m. Eastern okay. for sure. But I think we're actually in on Sunday night as well. So we're basically 24-7 now, but that's when we get going uh, Monday morning. You know, it's shocking to me, that, and we text frequently, yeah. but the, yeah, it's yeah. shocking yeah. to me that we ne- we only have you on like every six months. And I guess what the, you, the, when you were on last, it was the start of the season, and yet here we are almost wrapping up the season. It just tells you how fast mm-hmm. this winter's gone, huh? Well, let's see. If the Oilers don't make the playoffs, then there's a pretty good chance you're going to want me on at that point. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Are you in for that? If that. Uh... I'm in. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Let's all right. schedule it. Robin, anything else? Are we good? Can we let the man go? No, I'm, I'm all good. Although I'll just quickly point out because uh, Darren tagged it on Twitter, I believe. I love that Brooks Kepka video. That, oh, uh, geez. That was nice. Okay. Wasn't yeah, that cool? young boy struggling with, well, it didn't look like he was struggling, but he has struggled with cancer and, you know, Brooks Kepka brings him behind the ropes. I mean, it's all orchestrated. The marketing people are involved. Who cares? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like Brooks did a wonderful, beautiful thing for a young guy who, you know, he's going to remember all of that for the rest of his life. And I, you know, as I said in the tweet, you know, pro athletes do so many good things behind the scenes. Bryn, you know that from oh, yeah. a former life that we never know about. We never hear about. They don't want us to hear or know about it. But every once in a while, it's nice to look behind the curtain because yeah. you know, the majority of these people are really top-notch human beings. When I was working for the Oilers, there were two players in particular. Uh, Curtis Joseph was one, and the yeah. other was Dougie Wade. And they used to do these player cards. Yeah. And that they would take out to events and sign and just give them out to the kids and that kind of stuff. Those two guys in particular 
always ask me for another stack of 250 and I'd go, what do you need those for? I just want to, you know, I'm going to watch a movie tonight. I'm just going to sign a bunch, pre-sign them. And I'm kind of thinking that's a, what a bunch of bullshit. It's not what you're doing. And then I would find out a week later that, uh, (laughs) that Doug had gone to the cross cancer Institute one day without telling anybody and had met up and had gone through uh, the kids wards. Yeah. And, and Cujo at the Stollery children's hospital, that kind of stuff. He always found out, and they never wanted people to find out that stuff. They just no. wanted to do it. And you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, players, not only in the National Hockey League, but football, golf, they, they just do their thing, and they're happy to do it quietly. Cujo reached out to me recently. So you guys can see the Stu Grimm. I was looking at thing. that, yes. Yeah, so the Grim Reaper. So, I mean, this turns out to be decent real estate because of the number of shows that I do on TSN from home. Yeah. So, uh Cujo's book is on the top shelf. You probably can't see it, but I had it here for the <laughs> longest time. And his son took a, a picture and screen grabbed it and then sent it to Cujo. And then Cujo texts me. He goes, oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. That's awesome. The number of people that reach out to me because of, of the book spot is awesome. That yeah. And for people who don't know what we're talking about because they're only listening, it is the right. book. Is that your showcase location right next to that microphone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. You've got too many awards there. Yeah, well. There's a good reason for that. Uh, guess who just blew by Cujo on the all-time win list for the Edmonton Oilers? Did you see that? Miko Koskinen. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know what? Stoff put out a good uh, tweet the other day. He actually pointed out that Koskinen's numbers are not as bad as we've been thinking. It's just He's got some horrific mistakes. If he only had to play 50 games and the defense was a little better in front of him, you never know, right? You give I, give those snipers one extra nanosecond to pick that top corner over oh, his glove, yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. dead. So my one year in Edmonton, 97-98. Yeah, you remember uh, the series against Colorado, and Curtis made, makes that diving save on Rennie Corbett. I have a signed it, autographed Corbett? picture Corbett? of it at home in my wall. Number 20. From yeah. inside the net. He's Ridiculous. reaching back. Yeah. He's reaching back. Yeah. I'll yeah. never forget that. Yeah. Game seven at the McNichol Sports Arena. Do you know who I met on the first intermission? John Elway was brought down oh, no, by okay. Freddie Fleming, came, came down. Uh, they, they were trying to stay away from okay. the crowd. Real quick, one more story on yeah. that. So that series, Elway, uh, so ba- that was back in the day where, you know, we, we, we would record our video and we'd have to go then to a local affiliate station and feed it back yeah. to Edmonton, right? So we're at the ABC station. We're packing up our gear. We've already fed. And I could see on the in-house monitors that Elway was doing an interview. Like, and I just assumed it had been taped and that's what was on the air. So big glass ABC building in Denver. And I see the escalator moving. It's Sunday. Here comes John Elway. So he, I'm like, get your camera. Get Elway's coming out. I said, you know, I'm just going to, it's going to be a, I'm asking him on the fly, just roll. So, you know, Elway's not even paying attention. So he opens the door. We're rolling on this. <laughs> and he grabs the railing of the stairs and he can't get down the stairs. His knees are so shot wow. that he's got two hands and he's cr- crawling down the stairs and he doesn't see us. And he looks up finally and he goes, Oh my God. Jeez, and I'm like, I'm like, Hey, John, you know, Darren Dreger, H.L. Edmonton, look, you know, if you got a minute, we just want to get your thoughts on, we're here covering the Stanley Cup playoffs, da 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 Having some fun. He goes, yeah, and he goes, bud, he goes, I'll do whatever you want as long as that video never sees the light of day. Wow. Because he was right in the, yeah. the process of my retiring. Am I like, I mean, it would have made headlines across the world. And the camera guy, I'll never forget, literally just took it and just went and ripped it. And we did like a 90 second interview with John Elway talking about the avalanche of the Oilers. <laughs> so there you go. Cool, cool. <laughs> okay, man. Thanks. Have a All great right. week. Uh, appreciate right. it. And uh, uh, yeah, give us a retweet once it's out. That Because yeah, honestly, yep. I, we, yeah. we never had anybody uh, following us in Finland until you retweeted. <laughs> or the Czech Republic. Your reach oh, is immense. Awesome. Okay. All right, buddy. Thanks. See, See you later. Be well, Robin. Take care. Okay, bye. <laughs> So here we are. It's the spring, and hey, look who's in the studio, Brent McIntosh from the McIntosh Group at REMAX River City. How you doing? I'm well. How are you, Brent? Great. It's nice to have you in here. The spring is here. 
And things are getting busy. Spring has sprung and the market is on fire, Bryn. Absolutely incredible for single family houses anyway in R- Edmonton. Really? And it's just kind of flipped the switch, huh? I've never seen an increase in values this much in the last 30 days. Absolutely incredible. Edmonton's uh, growth for the single family market. And and I, I can't put a pinpoint on why, but it's pretty awesome if you own a house in Edmonton. Now with the economy the way it is, and it's just kind of crazy right now with everything that's going on in the world how is that affecting us? That's a great question. Um, do you want some time to think about I it? I do. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if you know, it's not like Edmonton's completely insulated from everything. But, yeah. you know, when we, when, if we're talking about the Russian war, for example, and, and the yeah. price of oil, that's nothing but a good thing for all of Alberta. So that's going to drive the house prices. The unfortunate positive of that's a right. horrible negative. It, of, of course. Uh, every time you pay more at the gas pump, it's, it's brutal as a family, but pretty good for the economy. Yeah. So how do people get, I know, how do people get involved? If they're thinking about it, now's the time to move, right? Well, definitely. If you're thinking about selling, I can't think of a better time to give us a call. We're at 780-464-0075. And either myself or one of my team members would be happy to meet with you to talk about the sale of your property. What about getting an evaluation done on their house if they're looking at selling? Yeah, that's where we'll start. Completely complimentary. No obligation. And we'll come, we'll sit down, we'll talk about the value, we'll show what's going on in the market. And we'll uh, even give you the seller some tips on how to get the most out of their house. Perfect. So once again, how do people get a hold of you? 780-464-0075 or on the web, macintoshgroup.ca. And here you are in the sports thing. It's yeah. nice to have you here. Well, I, I, I love watching you guys do the sports show. Excellent. Thanks. Wow, that's quite the show. Big thank you to Darren Drager for joining us. As always, like I say, we don't have him on enough, but I guess he's right. If something happens with the Oilers or doesn't happen with the Oilers and they don't make the postseason dance, uh, yeah, it's going to get a little active around here. So the thought yeah. of having him back on is tantalizing, but I guess in some ways you don't want to see it, Robin. Well, I tell you what, the one thing I took out of the talking with Darren, and it's always fun to talk to him, we, and we don't have him on as often as we probably should, that insider gig gets tougher by the year when you've got social media and reporting is all but instantaneous. There was a time if you had the drop on people, you had the drop on them for hours, if not a day or two, uh, just because of the, you know, the pre Twitter days. Now I tell you what, every whoever can thumb type the fastest, once they get the information, they break the story. I know a lot of fans don't care about that as much as people in the business do, but that's a tough gig. That insider thing, uh, that's a, that, you know, it's almost as tough as being an outsider. That's all I'll say. Insiders on with the outsiders today. That was, uh, that was a blast. Hey, you can check us out on Twitter. The handle's really simple. It's at Outsiders2020. Make sure you follow us and don't hesitate to get a hold of us on Twitter and give us your thoughts. Maybe there's a show or an episode or a guest that you're interested in. Please send us send us a response on Twitter. We uh, we would appreciate it. Keep it clean. Also, tell your friends to subscribe to our RSS feed on any of your favorite ear candy sites like Apple, Google, Spotify, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because uh, that's the best way for you to get our show the moment it gets downloaded, which is usually on a Monday. That will not be the case. We are uh, downloading our show next Tuesday because it's NHL trade deadline day on the Monday, and it doesn't make any sense for us to go on until we know what's happened. So we're going to be out on the Tuesday, the day after the NHL trade deadline. We're also on YouTube as well. Some people still download us on YouTube, even though they can't see us, but they still want to listen to us. So we thank you for that. Okay, studio name, Robin. You're in the southwest part of the city of Edmonton. No studio name yet? Sam Studio? Yeah, you know what? I always call it Lucky Sam Studios, but... uh, Well, I'm um, changing this right now then, because that way I don't have to keep bugging you. Lucky Sam Studio. We're going with that? Is that what you're going with? Okay. Let's do it. Yes, that's a uh, wonderful salute to your son. So, uh, Lucky Sam... Sam's, as in Sam Studio in Southwest Edmonton. And I'm at the Road 55 Studio in downtown Edmonton, a block and a half from Rogers Place. Your support is greatly appreciated. We, uh, as I say, we do appreciate any kind of feedback you can give us. And uh, we just get bigger and better. When you retweet, in particular, to your buds, the fact that a new show is out, that's how it gets spread far and wide 
on this planet. So uh, that's it for today, Robin. Nothing more? No, I think I'm good. Well, then let's chill out and get back to get very back at it next week. Mm-hmm. Sounds good to me, pal. Storm in the castle. Road 55.